Well, welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, I'm excited to talk about the life and the ministry of John G. Lake. I want to learn insights from him as we look and study his life. He truly was an incredible man that was a voice of healing in his hour, but he was more than that. He sought to teach the church how to walk in the dominion that Jesus won for them on the cross. How to walk with authority and be who you are supposed to be. Walk in the supernatural and experience the, the fullness of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. In his ministries, he saw incredible power. We look at, for example, Spokane. And we can look at the uh, healing homes that he started and his preaching ministry, of course. And he saw so many people healed that it was declared during the time of his ministry to be the healthiest city in the world. He saw more people healed in his healing homes than in the local three churches, I mean three hospitals. So his impact was incredible. He would get to a place where he was on the front page of all the local newspapers in Spokane. He would meet with people like Gandhi and other famous people. So he was a nobody that God made a powerful somebody uh, that truly was a voice and a person of great impact and influence at the turn of the 20th century. As I look at his life and ministry, I also believe that he is a great example of the importance and power of spiritual fathers. Those authoritative people that we trust, we get impact and influence from. So as I look at his life, I'm going to be highlighting that and the impact and how it was sometimes negative and positive uh, because we so much follow the, the path often that our fathers go down. John G. Lake um, was a man that was born on the 18th of March in 1870 in St. Mary's, which is in Ontario, Canada. That was the hub of Protestantism at the time, uh, Ontario. His family were the Kirk Scottish, and so he was Presbyterian. He got his name Graham from his mother. Uh, she was Graham, and of course his last name was Lake from his father. Somewhere along the line, his family became Methodist, and this was critical because John was greatly influenced by John Wesley. Well, John was always a person burdened for the Lord. He has a heart after the Lord, even from an early age. Uh, and, and the Lord is really pulling on him, tugging on him on this call. And when he was young, there's a young lady that he meets with that is dying. And on her deathbed, she has this vision of heaven that really influenced John, had a major impact and really began to pull and tug on his heart. He then had an encounter with the Lord at the Salvation Army. And so he really commits his life to the Lord and has a holiness type baptism of the Holy Spirit, where he gets filled with the Holy Spirit uh, without, of course, the gifts and tongues and such like. He commits his life to the Lord, even from this early age. He wants to walk right and holy. And when his parents would move to northern Michigan, we see him commit and consecrate that he will not smoke or drink as an early teenager. But he's going to walk holy because there's something in him that's drawing him and he knows he's been drawn towards ministry. Uh, we see at an early age that he suffered severe constipation and he prayed about it and the Lord healed him, even though he doesn't fully believe or understand the, the message of healing. Um, he would, at that time, um, his family are almost like under a curse where sickness and disease just plagues them. And as we go forward and we continue to look at John, this would really lead him down the path. And what the enemy meant for evil, the Lord would turn around for good as he became wholly frustrated and provoked and goes after the Lord that, you know what, when he lays hold of certain promises that you came to destroy the works of the enemy, this is not of you. So he went after the Lord.
Well, he would move to Chicago. Uh, he is drawn to Chicago because he goes there to the Wesleyan College to study to be a pastor. And he is offered a pastorship in Wisconsin, which he turned down. He decides to go to Harvey, Illinois, which was on the south side of Chicago. And it was named after a relative of Moody. Um, here he starts a newspaper. Uh, and it's during this time, he also is working in the construction industry uh, in Chicago as well. Uh, he would meet his wife, Jenny. She was from Michigan, and she really would be a, a partner in ministry with them. They were very uh, in tune together. Uh, there was a really beautiful and powerful marriage uh, that Lord, the Lord brought together. These two people flow, and they're going in the same direction with the Lord. They have the same burden, the same heart. And she's a prayer partner. You know, they knew spiritually uh, when the other one needed prayer and they were able to get right into prayer. They were there and had each other's back. They supported and they complimented each other in ministry. Uh, she would uh, counsel people and she had great discernment so that when they were praying for the sick, she somehow would be able to discern what the roadblock was if necessary. And, and so she really assisted him and worked with him. Uh, and, and, and so they were married in Millington, uh, which is on the southwest side of uh, Chicago. It's kind of far out from Chicago, another little town. But it's during this time he also makes connection and meets up with other great ministers that are particularly involved with the healing ministry. Uh, and he becomes more aware of Dowie. You have to understand that this time, the early 1890s, um, Dowie is growing in influence in Chicago. And there's no way that you could be in Chicago and not have heard of Dowie. Well, we've been talking about John Wesley being a spiritual father uh, in many ways for John G. Lake. There's a lot of influence that uh, Wesley had on him. And we see that even from the early age, John would pursue and be involved in Bible studies, learning the Word and under a strong Wesleyan uh, uh, church. And he's really influenced by the heart and the burden of John Wesley. In the 1890s, we see John Alexander Dowie become another spiritual father and have great impact and influence on um, John G. Lake. Of course, at this time, he's in Chicago. And it was in 1894, around there, that he actually would meet Dowie on the streets of Chicago. It's hard, if you were in Chicago, not to be aware of um, the ministry, the, the influence of John Alexander Dowie. He's on the front pages of the newspapers. He's, you know, constantly in the news as he challenged the, the leaderships, the city. Uh, he's a man very outspoken. He's critical in many ways. And he's very strong and bold on the ministry of healing. And he's gained a lot of followers. He has places uh, throughout the city, throughout downtown. So everywhere you went, you'd been uh, encountering something regarding Dowie. And they're very strong into evangelism. So there'd be a lot of people on the streets. And so he meets him. And of course, um, you know, John's family are plagued with sickness and disease. And so his brother is on his dying bed and he takes his brother uh, to the healing home, which is actually the headquarters for John Alexander Dowie. And it was on Michigan and 12th, right there um, by currently where we have the uh, parks uh, along the lakefront. And it was an old hotel, beautiful building, a lot of woodwork on the inside. And he comes to this place and he has John Alexander Dowie pay, pray for his brother. And his brother is instantly healed. Um, shortly afterwards, John would um, hear about his sister uh, who is dying. And he would go back to the town where his parents were, of course, in uh, Salt St. Marie in northern Michigan. And he calls and he contacts Dowie and he says, look, I need your prayer. And they agreed to pray at a certain time. Um, and he, his, his brother-in-law is there. It's a very sad and difficult scene. And John becomes disturbed on the inside of him. He doesn't fully understand or know the healing ministry, but he gets an agreement and he knows that Dowie does because he's seen Dowie um, minister and heal all kinds of diseases and people in the name of Jesus. And so they get together in agreement, and of course his sister gets healed uh, miraculously under the ministry of um, John Alexander Dowie.
Well, John and his wife, Jenny, um, she had suffered from a heart problem and tuberculosis. And the doctors had recommended that they would go to a climate that was perhaps better for her. So they returned uh, to Salt St. Marie in northern Michigan to where the family is. Uh, he started another newspaper up there and they began to settle in. Uh, they become more involved with the church of Dow. There's a church up there. And it's in that ministry that um, Jenny would become converted and led to the Lord. In 1898, um, they again become more involved with uh, the Dowie ministry when she becomes very ill after giving birth to a son. Uh, she would actually go into a coma. And so they have Dowie pray and she is healed and recovers. In 1899, they were both water baptized by Dowie uh, in Chicago. And they would actually be a part of the um, opening ceremonies and work that would occur in 1900. John Alexander Dowie at this point is at his um, high. He is at his greatest point in ministry in the late 1890s. Um, he is now talking about this utopian city that is going to build north of Chicago and he announces it on New Year's Day, 1900. And so it is a great thing. It sounds so phenomenal. If you ever read about it uh, without looking at it with discernment, it sounded incredible. But it would begin the beginning stages of, of course, Dowie becoming derailed. But many people are now connecting because Dowie has phenomenal influence uh, and said he has got a worldwide ministry. And he's already beginning a work in South Africa. He sent in a man called Buckler, and he has set up a church in South Africa, which would be the place, of course, where John G. Lake would go. Uh, it is around this time that he now ordains um, John to be a deacon in the church up there in Salt St. Marie. And in 1900, I believe it was around August, um, Jenny is accidentally shot. Uh, by a four-year-old and is paralyzed. He's in terrible pain with it. Uh, and so they appeal to the church um, and to get the elders and to connect with Dowie to pray. And of course, she is once again healed of this and her testimony would make the front page of the he uh, Leaves of Healings newsletter of John Alexander Dowie. And so they, again, this connection begins to grow. Uh, they take on the full uh, um, understanding of healing regarding John Alexander Dowie, which of course is to ignore medicine and doctors. Um, Dowie, of course, would go on a war in 1899 around there against doctors. And so this incident where Jenny is injured, they do not call for a doctor. Uh, there's no doctors ministering to her in this terrible time. And you got to imagine the newspapers uh, went to town, but she is miraculously healed. And that incident would actually launch John G. Lake's ministry. Spikibu came to hear about this incredible healing. Um, and so he starts to preach almost every night. he begins to gain greater influence and respect under Dowie. In 1901, they would actually move to Zion, Illinois. Shortly afterwards, uh, John would be uh, ordained an elder in the church uh, as he continues to grow in influence. And now he's in a leadership role. Uh, and he really becomes more acquainted with, uh, mentored by John Alexander Dowie.
It's interesting because, of course, at this time, John Alexander Dowie uh, is starting to derail, as I said. But as you look at that, he starts to announce himself, of course, as the uh, Elijah, and then as the first apostle. And he's starting to talk about setting up these Zions worldwide to see a restoration uh, of the church and a, a climate set up for Jesus to return. He believes that he now has the spiritual gifts and that he's got the minister gift of an apostle. So he's seen the restoration of the gifts and of the ministry gifts. And so this would lay the groundwork, of course, uh, for Pentecostalism, which would begin to occur in Zion. So it was around 1900 um, that Jenny and John would become connected with Parham. And Jenny became a friend with um, Parham's wife. And that would begin a relationship, uh, a connection for John G. Lake. As we see that time period, John becomes connected with Bosworth. They become good friends. And God is setting up connections that will enable him to go to South Africa. Um, we see that the person in South Africa, um, Buckler, becomes concerned. He sees what's going on in Zion, Illinois, and he becomes disillusioned and he breaks free from the church. And he's replaced by Bryant, a friend of um, John G. Lake. Again, God is setting the stage for John to be able to go there, have connections, have friends, and have people ready for him. And at the same time, God is working on this people that are part of Dowie's church and preparing them for a Pentecostal message. We know in 1904 that, of course, the Welsh revival occurred, 1904-1905, and really an atmosphere was starting to grow in the church, an excitement for revival that sparked something in California that led to the Azusa Street Revival of April 1906. In the summer of 18, sorry, 1906, Parham would actually come to Zion, Illinois, and he would preach Pentecostalism. Now, by that time, John G. Lake had left. He left uh, around the end of 1904. He was starting to see a lot of things going on. Um, Dowie, of course, had assumed complete control over the finances. He was starting to see a lot of lawsuits over finances, issues. Uh, the city's on the verge of bankruptcy. And Dowie refuses to let go. He refuses to allow a transparency uh, of what's going on. And now he's taking more and more control over the city and as I said, really starting to go and be derailed. So they would leave. Uh, John would actually purchase a seat on the Chicago Board of Trade, and he would get financing to start his own real estate company. That becomes very successful. Um, I believe like within his first week or two, he has got and earned over $2,500. And soon he would ac accumulate quite a considerable amount of money in the bank account. Uh, but the insurance industry uh, would start to have scandals, and so he actually would join up with another group of men, um, and he would end up getting a salary of about $50,000 um, at that time, which was an incredible salary. So John, God is beginning to work in him. He's left um, Zion, Illinois. But God is beginning to work in Zion, Illinois, and bring in a harvest of souls of people that have become disenchanted, people that are very broken. You have to realize that Zion, Illinois, the people have lost their money. The people are starving. They've come here with this great vision, and now they discover this leader has, in many ways, they seem to trick them, manipulate them, is controlling them. Um, and it's a very sad event in Zion, Illinois, as people have got to the place where there's simply no money. And so Parham comes in and he's begin to preach Pentecostalism. Um, John has several friends, including Bosworth, um, and they would actually go to um, Seymour in the Azusa Street Revival. And actually Seymour became a critical friend for John G. Lake. Um, John learned a lot from him 
and as a black minister, you know, um, really had a major impact in preparing John for going to South Africa. Uh, he learned a lot and he actually relies on Seymour uh, in the future years. It's interesting that when he went and he starts the church in South Africa, he would also call it the Apostolic Faith Mission in honor of um, Seymour and Parham. John is very interested. He's hungering for this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And for some reason, it just seems to elude him. And he has his first experience where he's crying out and he sees this bright light. And the Lord turns up and really begins to expose issues in his life that need to be addressed and changed. You know, we look at Dowie, for example, and we all go through a wilderness experience where God really wants to shine His light on us and expose those weaknesses, those darkness in us, so that they don't become the areas that we stumble in later on in our life and ministry. Um, and so he realizes all these areas that he needs to repent of, change, and deal with. Dowie, of course, had gone through something similar many years ago. Uh, but Dowie never really addressed and dealt with issues. And of course, the same issues would continue to haunt Dowie and ultimately caused him to stumble. So John G. Lake is hungry for this baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, and he has this experience. And he begins to pray, and he prays for quite a number of months, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Parham's been coming, and there's a meeting Parham he can't get to because he's been invited to go pray for this lady with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and as he gets there, they begin to pray, and of course he's with his friend Tom. They became very close friends. They worked very closely together, him, Tom, and Bosworth. So Tom is there and he's praying and he's really seeking, um, you know, to be ready for laying hands on this lady so she would receive our healing because she's in such a bad state. And all of a sudden he receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he begins to pray in tongues and he is utterly changed. It is an incredible experience, a life-changing experience for John that from that point on he's going to preach the Pentecostal message with fire. It sparks something on the inside of him that he would step into a ministry of the Spirit, by the Spirit, and really preach the message of the supernatural, that God desired that we live in a not the natural realm, but the supernatural realm. That, you know, we look at Romans 8, that there's the law of life, um, of death, the sin, I'm sorry, the law of sin and death, the law of survival in this world, but we're called to the, the law of life in Christ Jesus. It's the law of the Spirit, and that we're meant to walk and live on a higher plane and walk with dominion and authority. And this was the message that John begins to get and understand. And I think too often today we take casual the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was precious to these, this early uh, Pentecostal movement. It meant a lot. They would hunger for it. They would go after it. They, they, it was something powerful and precious to them. And if you were to read a lot of the people that got it uh, in Zion, Illinois, broken people that just experienced the most incredible things when God would restore them with that baptism. And so it meant something to them. And John never loses that passion, that hunger. And of course, he wrote the book Spiritual Hunger because he believed in it. Uh, that, that hunger that you should never lose it, that you should always press forward. And that as much as you have, you should be content where you're at, but never satisfied, desiring more. And so when you look at John, that is clearly the man he is. You've got to have more of God. And it goes back to this experience. 
Well, they prayed over that lady with arthritis, um, arthritis and she is healed. And of course, the guy Tom recognizes something's changed and you've got the baptism. Um, and of course, it said it was the beginning of a new day uh, in the ministry of John G. Lake. Well, John, during this time period, um, he is, feels this burden to go into full-time ministry. And um, he's trying to run from it. And one day he's walking with Tom and Bosworth. And Bosworth tells him, you know, that the Lord's telling him to go into full-time ministry. So John, they all get down on their knees and they pray uh, and just consecrate and dedicate themselves. And they agree. And so John would then go in because you got to understand when he is working He's distracted by the Lord. He cannot work properly because he gets so focused on the things of the Lord. People would come in and he's supposed to be selling them insurance and he begins to talk to them about the Lord and, and really open up and discern issues in their life and minister to them. Now he's very success, successful. He's making 50000 a year. So he tells his boss, you know what? I'm quitting to go into full-time ministry. And his boss said, you know what? Why don't you go and do it for three months? Because I know after three months, the, the salary of 50000 is going to draw you back and you'll feel good that you've done your time preaching and such like. Well, John never returned to um, working again full time like that. He, from that day, would now serve the Lord. He sold all his um, belongings, gave everything, because he now feels led to go to Indianapolis. The Lord has told him to go to Indianapolis and to prepare because they're going to go to South Africa. Um, John was greatly influenced and impacted Red David Livingston. And I think inside of him, again, there is this pioneering spirit that he saw in John Wesley. And uh, he wants to go reach and, and touch new lives and go to new levels, new places. And so he feels this burden to go to South Africa. But he's to go to Indianapolis first. He's going to rent this big hall. And he goes with Tom uh, down there and a group. They actually go down to Indianapolis. And they begin holding meetings down there that are very successful and God has begun to prepare them, get them ready for this move to South Africa. They would begin to meet. They met the flowers uh, while they were in Indianapolis and, and she became a great friend, the wife and Mrs. Flower. Um, of course, she had a critical role in the birthing of and the development of the Assemblies of God. So during this time, they also discover how much it's going to cost to get to South Africa and they don't have the money. John made a commitment that once he left um, the job that he would walk by faith. They were extremely generous people. I mean, they gave away everything and you see that throughout his life. He is generous to a fault. In fact, sometimes perhaps over generous. He saw the need of others as more important than his own and was willing to give even if it cost him a lot. And so now they're living by faith. They're trusting God. They didn't take up collections. Uh, they didn't pressurize or put the burden on people. They're trusting the Lord. And this is something that they would do the rest of their life. And so John is trusting the Lord for this money to come in um, for, so they can go to South Africa. Well, and John, when he stepped into full-time ministry, he had a dollar in his pocket. And again, he's living by faith. He needs $2,000 um, to go to South Africa. And he's trusting God. And it literally came down to days before all of a sudden the money came in and they know they're released to go to South Africa. They would board and they actually stopped off in England. He preached a little bit in England. He also tracked down a lot of stuff regarding Wesley because he's greatly influenced by John. And they arrived in May in South Africa. And when they are deboarding, you have to have $125 cash in order to, uh, or money in hand, in order to uh, be able to go into South Africa. Um, John doesn't have any money. 
So he's praying, he's trusting the Lord, he's been standing, and they're like, what are you going to do? And he said, you know, God has not failed us, God's going to be faithful, and he just trusts God. And somebody behind him stops him and says, can you step out of the line for a minute? And uh, he gives him a check for uh, additional money, and it's more than enough to meet the $125, so they're able to deboard and actually go into South Africa. Now the next problem, they don't have anywhere to stay. Um, no plans are made, he's just living this thing and walking it by faith. And this lady comes and said, she's looking for this family, and she comes up and said, are you the family? Um, and she said, you know, I'm expecting a family this many. Yep, that is us. And she brings them, and she's been led by the Lord to, to prov uh, provide this house, and they get this cottage um, that is furnished for them. It's not the greatest cottage, but it's a cottage, and it's a place now that John and his family can now minister from. As God begins to open a new door, uh, which John would describe as his greatest days. These are exciting times when he stepped into South Africa and began the Pentecostal ministry there. Now, as we look at South Africa, God had begun to do a mighty work. A lot of things had gone on, the Boer War, um, and so they're in a terrible state. Um, unemployment is high, um, you know, people are suffering greatly. There's a financial crisis going on. It's not a good time in South Africa for anybody. And of course, there is racism as well. And so John is coming over at this time, but at the same time, in the spiritual, you have a man called Andrew Murray. And Andrew Murray, of course, is part of the Dutch Reformed Church there. And he has been preaching, and he's been preaching a message that's very Pentecostal in many ways. And he preached and he wrote a book on divine healing. Um, and he's so really going to work in preparing the people and getting them ready. That book on divine healing would, and, and on the Holy Spirit, it offended the, the church and they actually pulled it back. Um, but it laid the groundwork so that when John G. Lake came and he connected with the Dowie Church in South Africa, those people knew of him, and of course they're being impacted, and that's the first place he would go and he would minister, and there's great success. Uh, the Holy Spirit would move and it became, he was like a cyclone immediately. When they came in, there was great power. Uh, people are getting healed and delivered, and it, of course, draws the crowds. Uh, the people, of course, at that time are right based on everything that's been going on in the country. And John is a person that he is not racist in any way. He is not, um, he, he sees everybody as equal and he treats them as equal. When the people came in, he allowed them to worship the way they worshiped. He didn't suppress it. He allowed the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit. He allowed the gifts of the Spirit to flow, prophecy to flow. And they saw great power. And you know, when people would come along to jeer and to sneer, they were impacted by the Holy Spirit. Lives are turned upside down and changed, and it's a phenomenal revival that begins to happen, and it begins to spread throughout South Africa. Uh, John would go to various places, and he began to minister uh, various places. When he would preach, it would be like a tag team ministry. You know, today we're so used to that one speaker preaching we go to hear that one speaker, but John had this tag team ministry where him, Tom, and maybe some others, uh, they would begin to preach and all of a sudden the next person would take over and then it would go to the next person and come back. And so they just flowed together as the Holy Spirit moved and they allowed the Holy Spirit just to have full control. You know, we got to realize the Holy Spirit believes that He is Lord. And when He turns up in a meeting and in a revival, He wants full control. And when we step in the way and grieve Him, He pulls back. Uh, and John Wesley talked about that, where they, you know, they came against the manifestations and they had divisions and they realized that the Holy Spirit had pulled back from them and they repented for grieving the Holy Spirit. And so you see again, this is in John. And so he feels this necessity not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but to allow the Holy Spirit the way to flow and to move. And of course, he's going after the people connected with the Church of Dawi because he's got credibility. He's known uh, with them and his you know he's gained a testimony through his wife and through that preaching he's got a name now as well
Now, one uh, day, John is going on a trip to the Kalahari, um, and we got to understand what life was like for them. They are sold out to the Lord. Uh, they don't take collections. There is an assumption that they're getting finances from America, which they weren't. They were living by faith. They don't take up collections and people aren't really giving to them. And they were, as I said, generous to a fault. So if they got money and they saw somebody with a need, they were willing to give. Uh, if they saw drunk people on the street, they would take them in and bring them home, dress them up, get them saved and send them out. So they minister continually. People were constantly in their house getting ministered to. And when John was gone, you know, his wife, who of course had the children, she's taking care of the children. She's also ministering to people. And they worked very closely together, as I said. Um, he would heal people. If someone didn't get immediately healed, he sent them to the back room. Uh, and there, him and his wife would minister to them. She would have a discernment. She'd pray with them. And if she saw the roadblock, the hindrance, she would explain it to them because they believed in speaking the truth with love and revealing issues, so they got them free. Remember, Dowie believed you've got to get saved. You've got to remove sin in order to healing. And this is in John and his wife, Jenny. So they look and they're preaching, of course, before you can get saved or healed, you've got to get saved. So they're preaching that message of salvation and they want to make sure you're right with the Lord. So they would work together very closely, minister people, and it's very long hours. Um, so they were exhausted. They're not getting a lot of food. And one day, while well, John is out at the Kalahari ministering, um, his wife um, took a stroke and she would die. John gets word and he comes back and, of course, his wife is dead. Uh, it was a devastating blow for John and it had a major impact. Uh, we see that John really was in love with his wife. And of course, she was a key asset in ministry. She was an assistant and really helped him. And so now there is an issue he faces with the children. And there's an issue he would face with um, the gap, filling that gap. Well, as I said, John's influence was growing. He had gained great respect with the Church of England. Uh, one of the people, of course, was um, A.A. Body in England who brought Pentecostalism to Britain, and he was an Anglican priest. He has a newsletter called The Confidence, and he begins to publish articles on uh, what is happening in John G. Lake's ministry, the testimonies of these healings. And the Anglican Church sent a bishop to meet with him and they begin to set up a conference and they're gonna have an investigation held into the healing ministry. They're curious about it and they wanna know the truth about it. Well, John and Tom decided to return to America in late 1909 um, to gain finances. On the way, they would go to London and they actually went to Lourdes, France for this investigation. Now, Lourdes is a place where the Catholic Church claims there was an apparition of Mary and that the waters now have a healing anointing and people get mystically healed. So people come to uh, Lourdes and they bring 200 doctors to investigate, are these healings legitimate? And they bring in all kinds of healers. There's psychic uh, and there's spiritualists. There's all kinds of healers and John G. Lake is one of them. And they bring five people that are incurable. Um, and they all have an opportunity to pray over or do what they want to heal these people. And finally, it's John's turn. And, you know, the people are still sick and he prays over them. And the first three get instantly healed. The fourth person gets healed within a couple of days. And the fifth person, unfortunately, died. But it really gained John a lot of, you know, great publicity and credibility in terms of the healing ministry. Um, they would go to America and he would preach in Chicago and Fort Wayne before they ultimately returned back to South Africa. After they returned to South Africa, Tom, of course, who's the president of the Apostolic Faith Mission, uh, accuses John of inappropriate action regarding finances and lack of leadership. Well, this would reach um, Alan Boddy, uh, who published something in The Confidence, and of course, this discredited John claiming that he was misappropriating finances or funds. An investigation, John is outraged and calls for an investigation, and an investigation is held. And John actually, in late 1909, would be um, proven uh, innocent, and Tom would actually be 
removed from office. John is then made the president of. But of course, that was a breaking of a key relationship that John had. So it was a very difficult time, a very challenging time. Um, but God would you know, open a new door for John and making him the president. John begins to continue to minister uh, in South Africa. And again, he would expand his reach and he's raising up new people. And they saw, as I said, great testimonies, miracles. Uh, and John would describe this perhaps as his greatest time in ministry. Well, around 1913, um, he decides he needs to return to the United States. He wants to return for time to regain, to strength. Uh, he's um, wore out and he wants change. And so he comes back to America. He comes to Michigan. Uh, and he would preach a little bit. He went to Wisconsin. Uh, and then during that time in 1913, he actually would meet his second wife, uh, Florence Witzer. And she was from Milwaukee. She brought new skills that really would assist John in the second stage of his ministry. Uh, she would also help him be a helpmate. And of course, he's got these children and she would have five children with him. Uh, it's interesting that John is really beginning to change as God ministers and works on his heart. And we see that how he started to behave is different in his latter years with his children. Uh, they would refer to him as being a much happier man that would spend time with them. You know, he'd recognize the mistakes he made with his younger children, and he seeks to correct that and rectify that um, with his new children. So John um, marries her. And he meets a person who was his old boss. And that person invites him to come work for him again. And John says, explains that he's in full-time ministry and he has his healing ministry. And this man, of course, is a proprietor of the railway system and gives him railway passes. And this is a great uh, thing for John because John is a burden out to go to Spokane. And so they decide to go to Spokane where he is going to um, open healing homes. Again, he is... Uh, following his spiritual father in many ways, um, Dowie, who had started healing homes. And at these healing homes, to understand what Dowie did, Dowie would bring you in, he would pray, he would minister, and he would spend time. He would sit with you and he would read the word nonstop. He would share and talk to you about the healing uh, promises nonstop until faith grew in you, until you actually received that healing um, and then you could go on and be a healed person. He believed very strongly, of course, Dowie, that you had to be saved first to receive healing, that you had to uh, address sin issues, and then you'd be healed. And so you see this same message in um, John G. Lake. He actually went to Spokane, and he meets up with a pastor of a church that were greatly influenced by Christian science. John does not believe in Christian science, uh, but he goes there and he's preaching a message and they said, this is not the message we preach, but you have liberty to preach it. And the pastor actually gives him the ability to administer um, a couple of his healing homes. And it really prepares John for what God is about to do next. Ultimately, John would separate from them. They became good friends. And John started his own work, uh, the Church of Spokane. And he also started at the old rookery, these healing homes, 
where he would minister to the people. Um, and we see that during the time period where John was in Spokane, um, I think it was something like 100,000 people were healed through the healing homes. Well, in 1915, John would establish the Church of Spokane uh, and then would start these healing homes in the old rookery. And they, of course, would be a place where so many were healed. I believe it's like 100,000 people were healed during John's time there, uh, during the five years. And in fact, more people were healed under John's ministry than in the local three hospitals. During his time of ministry there, it is declared that the government stated it was the healthiest city in America, if not in the world. Uh, so many people were getting healed. He would actually make the headlines in newspapers. It's interesting, 1918, the Better Business Bureau, you know, hears about him, and they decide to go after him uh, for giving a false message of misleading people regarding healing, and they investigate him, but they can find no grounds to charge him. Uh, because they are seeing there's great power in this ministry uh, and John is really having great effect. Uh, these were places where the sick would come and if you read what Dawi did, Dawi would spend the day just reading the scripture to them, praying with them, just filling them with the word regarding healing, building up their faith, ministering to them. And over a season, you know, they would get their healing, they'd be strengthened in the Lord, um, know who they were in Christ. And so John loves this, of course, he's been exposed to this, and he wants to bring this and begin this model in Spokane, Washington. In 1920, John would move to Portland, Oregon, and try to start a church there, the Church of Oregon, uh, Portland, sorry, uh, and start to duplicate that. Well, when he came to Portland, uh, he would go uh, at the park at Mount Tabor and actually have a visitation, uh, and he has this vision, I should say, of an angel that really brings him a message to basically contend for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to go after uh, a great revival, to press in and seek after. And I believe that we've got to lay hold. That's a powerful message to go after. You have to contend for. Uh, as you look, for example, at Evan Roberts, you look at um, Body, you look at Smith Wigglesworth, they all got hold of something, and of course it came from Evan Roberts, which was to storm heaven to go after it, that you have to press in and go after it, contend for and lay hold of that blessing and that promise of God and the outpouring. So we talked a little bit about what made John tick. And John was a man without compromise. When he laid hold of something in the Word, he sold out to it. He was committed to it. If you got a promise, he sought to live by it. He was a man of the Word. He loved the Word, spent hours in the Word, and he sought to live out the Word and be an example of the living Word. As I said, he was a man given to prayer. He was a man burdened for souls. He wanted to see souls for Jesus. Well, he did leave Portland. He went back to Spokane. Uh, he would find that the church there um, was taken from him, and you know he starts another church. Uh, during this time period, John talks about being wore out. He's you know becomes a lot more exhausted, and um, he starts holding tent meetings, and then in the nineteen. 34 period, he would actually go on radio and begin to preach on radio. In 1935 uh, in Spokane, he has a church um, a picnic in a park. And at that picnic, he sees a young lady and he takes her and said, you know, feed this young lady. She looks hungry. And he tells his wife, you know, I feel a little tired. I'm going home. 
and he decides not to go to church that night, which is unusual for him because he doesn't feel the greatest. He feels a little exhausted, and so he stays home. And when his wife comes home that night, uh, she finds that he has suffered a stroke. Um, John would survive for two more weeks uh, before he would pass home or pass away and go home to glory. You know, John left a, a legacy, and he brought, as I said, a very powerful message of walking in the supernatural. He took the healing message and really brought it to a new level of understanding, not alone is it your right, but we are called as believers to begin to walk uh, with a um, authority on the earth, with dominion on the earth, and that Jesus came to you know, destroy the works of the enemy. And now it's the church's job. And we need to be preaching this message of healing. We need to step up into our full position and reigning in life as kings. That we are meant to walk not by the natural, but by the supernatural, walking by faith. You know, he lived in many ways a difficult life. Uh, we look at his later life, a lot of his money uh, would be wiped out with the money he had by the crash of 29. But through it all, John continues to live by faith. He was a man, as I said, extremely generous and giving. And perhaps in his latter years, where he'd be criticized once again for his financial um, areas where they, they challenged him with mismanagement, he perhaps could have walked with greater transparency. But we see that same thing that came against Dowie trying to come on John G. Lake. And perhaps he could have learned from Dowie. But he did learn how to receive criticism and not like Dowie, you know, um, rebuke it, come against it, and, and deem it as absolute persecution. John learned how to love through it, how to walk right, and how to maintain this spiritual hunger. We need to understand that when people are persecuting us, that we're meant to leap for joy and rejoice and to recognize who the true enemy is and what the enemy is trying to do and steal from us. And that if we don't react properly, it opens the door for the enemy to take from us and perhaps to derail our ministry. And God wants us to step into new things. And of course, we have a new level, there's new devils, and we need to step up to the plate and realize that God wants in this hour to do something incredible. As we look at the ministry of John G. Lake and how that city of Spokane was so changed, we should expect the same in this generation. Can you imagine how powerful it would be if people started again to see the real healing ministry of Jesus, where like Dowie, John would share the names. So when he was investigated, he said, here's the names, here's the addresses, go ask them yourself. You know, a lot of time we bring people on the stage, we see them healed, um, but that's all you hear of them. You know, when you look at Dowie's ministry, people testified years later, famous people of being healed. And we see this in John G. Lake's ministry. He's not afraid that, you know what, go check them out, go test them, because they are genuine. He knew what God would do, could do, and believed he would do it in his ministry. There's a great story of John G. Lake where he is ministering. Uh, of course, there were many ministers that he raised up. Gordon Lindsay, he would meet in 1924 in Portland, and he would actually mentor many of these ministers. He worked with them. He spent time with them, training them. And he was training this one guy, and there's a line of people that are getting healed, and he's praying over them, and I believe it's like 100, 120 people. And the first 20 get healed. The rest, they're not seeing the power. And John takes the man aside afterwards and said, what happened? And the guy said, I don't know. And John said, you know, with the first 20 people, your eyes were fixed on Jesus. But with the last, your eyes were fixed on the people and the problem. And you know, there's a great lesson in that. If we're going to see the miracles and the power, it's not about something we have or us somehow uh, doing something to cause that healing. It's about us emptying ourselves and letting God do. In John G. Lake's ministry, there were supernatural miracles. You know, there's a case of one man that came. Um, he is in, I believe it was in uh, Spokane, around there, Portland, where he has lost his, lot, his eye. It's in a mining industry. I'm sorry, maybe in South Africa, my mistake. I'm starting again. You know, John G. Lake saw supernatural healings. An example would be a man that was injured in the mine um, where his eye is damaged, and they have told him they've got to operate right away. He's going to lose the eye. It is destroyed. And if they don't, 
you know, he's going to die. He's in a lot of pain. But what does he do? He chooses to go to a John G. Lake meeting. And they're saying, this is crazy. And he gets there. They take off the bandage. They begin to pray with him. And the people watch the eye being restored. And he's completely healed free from pain, and he leaves. See, these are the miracles that John would see. I mean, they were powerful. They weren't just people healed of a headache. People were healed of incredible things. They saw restoration in their life, their physical body. That's the message I believe in this hour this world needs to hear and see. And we got to look at men like John G. Lake, and what can we learn from them? And are we willing to pay the same price? You know, can we look at what he did right, what he did wrong, and not duplicate his mistakes, but duplicate what he did right? But are you willing to pay the price, even if it costs you everything? Because souls are on the line. And bottom line, that's what it's about. It's about souls for Jesus. Well, I pray that as you listen to this message, it is provoking you and challenging you because John raised up many people in his ministry. Not all of them were fine um, tuned and, 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 and respectful in that sense. You know, men were gruff and rough, but they learned how to walk by the Spirit. And in that hour, they saw great power. A lot today, it's focusing on one man. We see men building their agenda, their kingdom, not raising up other people. John continuously raised up, mentored, poured in, spent time with other people, training them, training local people so that there was always somebody to replace him. Somebody else, because you know what? As a leader, we must become irrelevant. We must disappear, and John did that. He really sought to do that. And while people would persecute him and come after him, and maybe he did a lot of mistakes, I believe his heart was right and his burden was for souls, and to see the body of Christ step up in full dominion and be a victorious church preaching a gospel of power. Well, I pray that you're provoked, encouraged, blessed, and that you would step up to the plate and serve this generation with your high call, that you would surrender all, pursue him. You know, it says in Psalm 16 that he will guard our lot, or our destiny. And I believe that we will surrender to Him. He will keep our destiny. And he will, um, you know, cause us to walk down the right path and lead us in the ways that we should go. And He will search our hearts if there be any wrongful way, if we'll let Him expose all darkness in us so that there are no stumbling blocks in us. There's no areas that when we get into our ministry, into our fullness, that will cause us to falter and be derailed. This is a critical hour where the world needs to hear a real voice, salt and light, a truth, and the church is meant to be that. So I pray that you, whatever that role may be, will step up and do your part because each part of the body supplying according to their proper function causes the body to grow. And when we lift up Jesus, all men will be drawn unto him. Well, thank you and be blessed in the name of Jesus.